Hi, welcome to COVID vaccine facts and fiction. Um, I'm talking with my friend Joel Kay, and my name is Avraham Khermon. And uh, we're here just to talk about COVID vaccine and uh, safety. A lot of questions that people have had over the last few weeks, months about the vaccine. And uh, I thought it'd be a good idea just to put, it, put out this video and uh, discuss what people's concerns are and uh, if they should be concerned, why they should be concerned. Uh, Joel, so tell me a little bit about yourself and about your background. Hi, Avraham. Uh, I am an immunologist. I have a PhD in immunology from the Weizmann Institute of Science. Um, and then I went to Harvard Medical School and did a fellowship in transplantation immunology. So my entire career has based in the world of immunology. And uh, if anything, 2020 is probably the world of immunologists or the, the year of the immunologist. Um, I, uh, I left academia 17 years ago and joined a pharmaceutical company called Teva, uh, which is one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world. And there I spent uh, 14 years developing drugs for multiple sclerosis and cancer. And two years ago, I left Teva and I joined a small biotech company where we developed drugs for rare genetic cancers. And I'm the VP of research. So that's me. I do research and immunology. All right, impressive. And uh, Joel and I know each other from Teva. Also, I started there 17 years ago. And since then I've moved on um, to a number of different positions. Now I'm a patent attorney in a firm. And uh, I guess throughout the last 17 years, here in Israel, I've been either in pharmaceutical companies or supporting them. So I've been actively involved in drug development processes, but from the legal side, uh, intellectual property side. So Joel, um, you recently were injected with the Pfizer vaccine. How are you doing? How, what's your take on that? How do you feel? So I got the vaccine on Monday. Uh, the uh, uptake of vac vaccination in Israel is leading in the world. Um, it's an incredible thing to see. Uh, my arm hurt for a day or so, and um, clearly one of the side effects is weird hair on the video. <laughs> that must be something that they haven't reported in the clinical trials. Uh, I feel fine. Um, uh, as of yesterday, a million people in Israel received the vaccine. Uh, so huge yeah, I'm gonna numbers. Put, I'm going to put up that graphic here. Oh, that's a different graphic. Hold on one second. Do you have that graphic handy? Ah, oh, here we go. Okay, I'll share it. I got it. So here's the graphic that shows Israel as of January 1st. So we're on January 2nd. You were vaccinated on Monday, so that's like five days ago. And uh, yeah. Israel's uh, pretty much ahead of the game. I think it's safe to say. It's gonna be hard to catch up. 11.5 vaccines administered yeah, per 100 people. Yeah. So I'm a little bit jealous. I didn't get mine yet, but uh, hopefully we'll get it soon. Yeah, I read an interesting article today. Uh, there were three three theories running uh, as to why Israel uh, is so successful. Um, the first was that we paid more than anyone else per vaccine. There might be some truth to that, but I don't think that's the reason because Overall, Israel is a small population. It's not that many vaccines. The second was that the prime minister appealed to the uh, CEO of Pfizer, who has who is Jewish and had parents who were survivors of the Holocaust, that this is the the Jewish state. Uh, that that uh, although makes a nice story, just doesn't make sense in a publicly traded company. The CEO doesn't have sentimental. Uh, feelings as 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 a motive for, for selling vaccine mm -hmm. and the third was uh, the one that actually made a lot of sense that the uh, public health system in Israel was pitched to Pfizer as a pilot program to see how quickly they could get it out uh, get it out to a large percent of the percentage of the population track the side effects see how quickly things were taking see the results uh, and that makes more sense than the uh, previous two versions, I would have mm -hmm. thought. Okay, interesting. I, I'm assuming that over the next few days, weeks, we'll, we'll learn more about that and we'll see uh, how this continues. Uh, right now, 
only uh, in general, the people that are getting vaccinated are medical personnel, people above 60 and people with other uh, previous conditions, right? I think that's the current status. So that's the essential rules. However, uh, what's happening in the field is that the packages came from uh, Pfizer at 975 vials a package. And that meant that the Pfizer freezing conditions uh, once they get thawed, it's stable for five days. So at the end of the day, if there are vials that are left over, instead of throwing them out, there are WhatsApp groups and SMS messages going out to people in the uh, in the HMOs in that city saying, we've got some leftovers, come over and get them. That's why you're seeing a lot of people under 60 without chronic medical conditions that have managed to get them. Mm -hmm. um, so, that, so, you know, on the one hand, uh, great. On the other hand, you would have hoped that the people over 60 got it first. But that, I believe uh, more than half of the population over the age of 60 in Israel have already received the vaccine. Yeah, so that's impressive already. So hopefully we'll see uh, a downturn in number of sick patients once the number of uh, vaccinated people goes up. So yes, but I think we're going to have to wait for the second injection, which is three weeks later for Pfizer, four weeks for Moderna then wait another seven days or so for the antibodies to kick in. I think you'll start seeing numbers going down anyway uh, because we're in a lockdown, because the number of people that are vaccinated are pretty large and there's already no efficacy after a single injection um, for both Pfizer and Moderna. So I think it's just a matter of time, but we'll see the graph going down. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, I think that some people that I've talked to are concerned about long-term side effects. Because as we know, you know, COVID-19 started roughly a year ago. And around that time, the companies started working on the vaccines. How do we know that someone's going to get injected? You know, you went, went, you went to get this vaccine. And were you concerned about long-term effects? Uh, not at all, uh, for several reasons. So one of the reasons is that uh, the vaccine is made of mRNA. And we can talk later about what the vaccine is and what mRNA is. But the one thing to realize is mRNA, once it gets injected into the cell, it doesn't stay there very long. Its job is to code for protein and the protein makes a part of the virus. And then the immune system attacks that part of the, the so-called part of the virus. And the mRNA doesn't hang around. So mRNA isn't there for very long. It's there for hours, I would say. Um, Although I'm going to go back and check that because maybe it's longer than hours, but it's certainly not longer than days. Uh, so long-term effects from the vir vaccine itself, non-existent. Um, but I think it's more important to talk about vaccines in general on long-term effects. So there are a lot of vaccines around. People get vaccines for flu, kids get it for measles, for mumps, rubella, uh, etc. When a vaccine is developed and approved under normal conditions, there's no long-term side effects that have been studied. You do all of the hurdles that are required to get it approved, all of the safety testing, all of the efficacy testing. And then once it's approved and it rolls out into a population and you start studying millions and millions and millions of people, that's when, if there are long-term effects, you'll pick them up over time after approval. It's not done before approval. So the concern is, mRNA as a vaccine is new, new technology, and we'll talk about that. And nobody studied long-term effects, but there is no this and A and B. You've got a new technology, yes, but long-term effects and vaccines are not studied prior to approval on any vaccine. And that's important to understand. So in terms of um, mRNA, you mentioned mRNA, uh, being short-lived and its function for making protein proteins. For, so what, from what I understand, just to go into the um, what this vaccine does, I understand that it encodes for a protein that makes up 13% of the virus, which is the what they call the spike protein, which is the external, you know, people see pictures of the COVID-19 virus and see this spiky ball. So uh, essentially what's happening is that the protein is encoding for that that spiky ball that that's on the surface of the of the virus 
And uh, how does that impact the, the person? In other words, is that safe? What's happening in the person, in, in the individual that has already received the, the vaccine once his body starts producing that protein? Okay, so just what you said before, this is a picture of the COVID virus and these red dots on the outside, those are the spike proteins. And uh, uh, the mRNA vaccine is a piece, a small piece of RNA that encodes for one of these red spikes that are sitting on the outside of the virus. And uh, just before we talk about um, the vaccine, let's just talk about the fundamental dogma of biology. When we talk about this, and you don't need to understand a lot of biology, we're talking about DNA, you know, the stuff that encodes our, all of our genetic information. DNA, its function is a coder to make RNA, and mRNA is a part of RNA. And RNA is a coder that makes proteins, and it goes in one direction. DNA inside the nucleus makes RNA outside of the nucleus that turns it into protein. And those proteins um, are what is recognized by the immune system. So we're talking about a, a, a single unidirectional process where DNA makes RNA that makes protein. And the vaccine here is sort of stepping in in the middle of the process. It's not impacting the DNA. It's not going into the nucleus right. of the so cell. The uh, vaccine is a tiny piece of RNA called messenger RNA messenger RNA because it's a messenger that gets taken up by uh, a whole bunch of things called ribosomes that turn it into proteins. And it happens outside of the area where DNA lives inside the cell, right? So the RNA can't go back and play with the DNA. It can only go to the right and make a protein. Yeah. So, so essentially, should, people shouldn't be concerned about their genetic material being impacted by this vaccine because they, their genetic material stays exactly the same. Their DNA stays their DNA. And right. this, this vaccine is just stepping in in the middle of the, the process and um, gets into the cells and uses those cells as little factories for making the protein. And that, that protein is what will cause the immune response and will generate antibodies and will give people immunity, right? So that's a great way of putting it. I like that. It's a, inside the cell is a factory that makes proteins. Those proteins go to the outside of the cell and they sit there and they wave at the immune system. The immune system comes and recognizes it, makes the antibodies. And those antibodies are what protect us from all viruses and all bacteria. And each virus and each bacteria has a specific antibody against it. So by injecting the RNA into a factory that makes the protein, that waves and says hi to the immune system, the immune system now makes antibodies specifically and only for the COVID vaccine mm -hmm. virus for that matter. Okay. So, um, you know, some people have said to me something like, um, you know, I'm a little bit concerned about being vaccinated now. Um, I don't want to be a guinea pig. You know, this whole thing was approved really quickly. How many people have been vaccinated so far? How many people have the vaccines been tested on? so far? So I'll break that down into a few points. So first of all, there are a lot of vaccines that have been tested out there. Uh, the ones that we are all talking about are the ones from Pfizer and Moderna, which are both the mRNA vaccines. China has its vaccine that it developed. Russia has a vac vaccine that it developed. Um, but for the, for the sake of uh, the question that you just asked, I want to focus on the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. So in their clinical studies, uh, in clinical studies, there are three phases, phase one, two, and three. Phase three are the bigger ones. So Pfizer and Moderna together in their phase three studies that allowed them to get approval had between them 70,000 people in their studies, half got placebo, half got vaccine. So 35, 40,000 people initially saw the vaccine before approval. And immediately after approval, first Pfizer and then Moderna, as of Yesterday, 5 million people around the world have already received their first injection. And I think in England already, some people have already received their second injection. So wow. the first, first woman in the UK uh, to get the first shot got her second shot on Thursday. Uh, so that's already three weeks. So again, 5 million people around the world have gotten a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, uh, the first injection. 
there have been reports of side effects. The main side effects are um, pain at the site of injection, like I had. Some people had fever, some people felt a bit dizzy. There were some allergic reactions in the UK and in other places. Um, but overall, we're talking about uh, pretty typical side effects of a, vir of a vaccine. Let's remember the vaccine's job is to get the immune system working. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we know that the immune system is working? We have side effects, why? Immune system, when it sees a virus, it makes proteins that kill the viruses. And those proteins induce a fever, they can induce tiredness, they can induce muscle pain and aches. So actually, when you feel tired and achy and a bit crappy after you got a vaccine, that actually means it's working. Okay, so hopefully it's it worked for you and it, and it's, it will be working for a lot of other people that got it. Um, I think I that think, we've- Actually, Abram, on our list, I don't think we had this, but now that you've mentioned it, I think I, I, I wanna bring something up. I think it's important that we understand what do the vaccines do? What do we know that they do right now? And what we don't know. So what we do know is this number that people have uh, reported all over the world that they say they are 95% effective. What does that mean? That means that in the phase three clinical studies, for every uh, 100 people that got the placebo versus 100 people that got the vaccine, um, for the sake of argument, these are not the real numbers, but let's say 95 out of 100, uh, well, no, I'm sorry. That's not the way to do it. Let's just say there's 95% protection from getting uh, viral symptoms. That's what we know. What don't we know? We haven't studied yet if the vaccine will get a person infected without any symptoms whatsoever. So they had the vaccine, they're protected, they get the virus, they're asymptomatic, but we don't know if the virus will stop that person from transmitting it to someone else, asymptomatic mm -hmm. transmission. And until we know that, and I think there are already some hints in some of the data that came out of the Moderna trial, until we know that, even after you got the vaccine, you have to be careful. You have to wear a mask. You have to keep your distance. You have to wash your hands. It's going to take two, three, four, five months until we know whether it protects from transmission. So having your uh, vaccination isn't a um, get out of jail card. It doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. Um, whatever the rules are in the country that you live in, if there are uh, rules about social distancing and masks, follow the rules uh, because we don't know yet how much the vaccine protects from transmission. Okay, that's an important point. Um, we've already discussed a few points that we that we we plan on discussing, but I think we're already our time is up for this episode. But uh, next episode, we could talk about um, how the vaccine was developed so quickly as opposed to other vaccines in the past that have usually take years to develop. And if that's the case, why should we uh, trust this development process? Why should we rely on it? And uh, looking forward to seeing you again and discussing these interesting topics. Thanks a lot right. for your insight. No problem. Have a good evening. You too.